talking and I am very excited today. Our guest is known as the Queen of African Tech, a renowned businesswoman and entrepreneur. Her political and social activism know no bounds. She is a CEO and founder of AppStack, a leading global provider of enterprise application solutions. Her foray into business started when she was barely into her teens and there has been no stopping her ever since. She co-founded the African Business Angels, uh, Angels Network and chairs Active Spaces which supports tech entrepreneurs from two hubs in Cameroon. She was listed as a top female tech founder in Africa by Forbes magazine, and the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, named her a global leader for tomorrow. A recipient of numerous awards, we had better meet her because her achievements will not let us start this program. So everyone, let us welcome the wonderful, the beautiful Miss Rebecca Enongchong. Welcome, Hello. Rebecca. Hello. Thank you. I'm so happy to be on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. We know that you're very busy and for you to take the time to be here. We're so pleased with that. Your presence has been greatly anticipated and our audience will be sending some questions throughout the interview for you. Uh, so to our audience, do not forget to send those questions. So Rebecca, you're very well known, but just as equally not known. So the Caribbean audience would want to know this part of you that has so eluded them. So I will, with a straight face, ask, are you married or do you have a partner and do you have kids? Wow, okay. <laughs> At least she started with the hardest uh, for me. I'm, I'm, I've, I've always um, been a very, very intensely private person. Um, yeah. Even like my, my own family like extended family always wonders um about my life and my yeah. private life and the reason that I don't talk about it is because um I am such a public person and yeah. I need to protect um those that are closest to me and so yeah. I don't usually talk I don't talk about it I have a family yeah. um yeah. but it's not one that I want to put out there in the in the uh, Twitter sphere in the um on the internet um yeah. so it's really just to protect them um yeah. from from you know because I, I i say things and i do things and I, I can take responsibility for my actions but i don't want those that are closest to me to suffer from it um and su suffer the consequences of it so i really i really am i'm a very 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 private person because of that Okay, we totally understand, but thank you for letting us know that. So uh, I understand you're a princess from the Besong Abang royal family as your father was king. Yeah, a princess Ibanga, indeed. <laughs> wow. So um, your father's reign was very much marred by the dispute of his position as a rightful ruler. And it is a long story, which I'm not going to get into uh, because we'd be here forever. But your family finally won the case after 13 years of battle from 1997. Uh, the case was eventually declared won by your family in 2010. So do you think that the government involvement uh, politicized the kingmaking process and somehow devalues the tradition and culture of not just Besong Abang, but other um, you know, tribes as well? I think that what happens is that any, any time the government, especially this government, touches anything, it's very political. It shouldn't be. You know, mm -hmm. our, our cultural leaders, our traditional yeah. leaders should be governed and selected by tradition um, and not by the government. But what has yeah. happened is that um, the government has uh, used this as means for um, some some political uh, for political reasons really so that yeah. you know if, if you're if you're not in their camp um yeah. they will you know they won't support you they will fight you and so on and so forth yeah. so i think you know this is one of those areas where you know our government has so many challenges um that yeah. it's not been, been able to i can't focus on that i think chieftaincy in a village as small as ours uh, is yeah. it, it's, it's just a waste of government resources and then just another means that the government uses to control its its uh, citizens yeah so uh actually you know moving on from this uh Besong Abang issue your mm -hmm. your father it's uh quite an interesting figure some people might not know who he was so your father is chief henry for abi enong chong he was a renowned barrister a business magnet a luminary he's also famed for helping to create the bar association in cameroon what do you remember your father for rebecca oh my goodness for standing up to for his uh beliefs always in yeah. all circumstances he was fearless and um, he taught us about hard work, 
Um, yeah. I've never seen anybody that worked so hard. This man worked until his last day um, oh on this earth and he worked. He got up in the morning and started, you know, giving instructions and and um, had a heart failure. Um, but really, it's it's, you know, he he was fearless um, yeah. and in incredibly hardworking, um, very, very, very diligent and very um like paid a lot of attention to detail, very organized. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't seem like that when you look at um, how our estate is um, is going on right now. But he was somebody that was incredibly, incredibly um, meticulous. Um, and I think people don't realize how how much that was um, at, that impacted him as a lawyer. You know, he was he was the first Cameroonian lawyer in Douala. Oh, so, wow. um, and people don't realize that. And, and uh, many in, in, in it, uh, the lawyers that were in Douala at the time were all French. And yeah. they told him that he couldn't practice in Douala, that he could mm -hmm. only practice in the Southwest yes. or the Northwest. Um, oh, wow. But if he wanted to practice in, 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 in Douala, then mm -hmm. he had to pass the French bar. <laughs> and my father um, sued. My father yeah. actually uh, <laughs> found a lawsuit and re requ requested one franc as um, one franc at the time as compensation. Yeah. But he, he, he won that lawsuit. And um, this was the beginning of the creation of the Cameroon Bar Association. Yeah. And your father did not just found the, you know, the Western Cameroon Bar Association, but he went on to find the, uh, you know, the, the integrated Cameroon Bar Association, both the Frankfurt and the Anglophone one that we have currently. Yeah, that's correct. You know, we, we I think my father was a great believer in um, in coming together as a nation. Um, yeah. what he what, even though um, and, and this is, you know, I always say how privileged I was to grow up in a household where um, this was such an important issue. We didn't start talking about the Anglophone issue in 2016. You know, this yeah. is something that I grew up with. And mm -hmm. he created an organization in in the early 90s. Um, mm -hmm. called the Cameron Anglophone Movement. Um, oh, really? uh, he chaired that organization for for some time. Um, this yeah. is the organization that became, um, you know, that has grown and continued in its various forms. But he was obviously very, very active um, in, in, in fighting for the rights of uh, Southern Cameroonians. Yeah, I do remember that the Cameroon Anglophone movement were very instrumental in the first all Anglophone conference that was called in the 90s when we were discussing, you know, the, the reformation of the constitution. So they were the ones who, you know, had a huge input uh, in, in the Boya declaration that unfortunately was, you know, ignored and we're where we are today. So your father did great work and may his soul rest in perfect peace. <laughs> so, um, Moving on from your father, I understand that you were born in Cameroon, but before, before, uh, so how long were you in Cameroon for before moving to the States, as I understand? So I was born in Yaoundé and we moved to Douala when I was about two or three or two and a half years old, about or almost three. And then I moved to the U.S. when I was on uh, between 14 and 15. Yeah. Oh, wow. So um, when you moved to the U.S., you then um, studied science and economics at the Catholic University of America. So how did you end up in technology? So um, I did. I started actually um, the, my first I started in um, first uh, studying international relations, um, mm -hmm. same as my mother at American University. Um, and then I was able to obtain um, a partial scholarship, at least. Um, to Catholic University, so I transferred there and decided to study um, economics. My 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 goal was to work in international organizations, perhaps like the World Bank or the IMF, <laughs> or something like that. Um, yeah. and, 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 but but there was it wasn't like a smooth ride. It wasn't like okay, I graduated high school and then I went to to university straight out and then yeah. I graduated and then I worked it, it wasn't it wasn't like that at all so um I I actually um it was off and on I worked my way all the way through school um mm -hmm. and so that a you know slowed down um my my schooling but it also yeah. uh, allowed me to um allowed me to work and gain 
job experience and work experience um, while I was going to school, which helped me greatly when I finished school. So, you know, some of the jobs that I had were in sales. Like I always say that my first job was one of the ones that I learned the most from um, probably because I was selling newspaper subscriptions door to door. Yeah. And so I would go from one door to another and I would have doors slammed in my face. I would have people insulting me. I would have people that would never open the door. But, oh, you know, God. I learned so many valuable lessons about that. And that, yeah. you know, the next door after the one that just slammed it may be yeah. your opportunity. That's probably the person that's going to buy the newspaper uh, subscription from you. <laughs> so, <Exactly>. so <laughs> it, it really taught me never to give up um, and yeah. that. The opportunity is just, it could be just the next door. And it doesn't mean just because a door is not is slammed in your face or a door isn't even open has yeah. no bearing on your abilities. Um, and so that was a lesson, a life lesson for me that I learned mm-hmm. very early on. I was just 15 years old. But that company mm-hmm. later recruited me to work inside their office. Exactly. Um, and so I was working inside their office. And one of the things I was doing is their bookkeeping. So their accounting, their, their small accounting um, yeah. is what I started doing. And then I started doing more and more of that. Um, yes. And so I, I, I was doing a lot of finance. And then when I exited, when I finished school, I was still mm-hmm. in finance, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and, and that's how I came into technology because oh. I was using technology tools in order to do whatever finance um you know, I, I, I needed to do. So that's how I came into technologies by, by, by being a user of, mm-hmm. of technology. And I just really fell in love with it. I just, I don't know, it was just something that happened. There was just this thing that happened when I, I, I would literally take computers apart and then try mm-hmm. to put them back together and just wow. for fun, you know, this was my entertainment yeah. and I loved it. And there was just this connection um, that happened be- with, with, with computers that I can't describe till today, it's still this like such an exciting thing because I'm still blown away by the fact yeah. that yeah, this is just people <laughs> made this and then they just added zeros and ones and here we are talking live on each other and like you can see the image. Exactly. Right? This, is, this, yeah. this is mind-boggling to me, you know. Yeah. Like the, I just, it's to me it's it's amazing and I I'm excited about it every day and excited about the potential of yeah. technology to transform our daily lives. You know, look yeah. at look at how mobile phones have transformed our lives. It just exactly. it's just incredible. So yeah. I, I'm just really blessed and happy that my father first was able to see some of that technology while he was still alive and yeah. see me using technology as a way to um, create wealth and create a business. Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting story. And I like the how you, you're always so positive, even when you got, you know, the people rejected your office, when you were selling newspapers, and also your growth within that company and your interest in technology. And now look at you, you sit on a board with uh, um, Salesforce, but let, we'll come to that later. So you're not new to starting and running businesses. Um, and I would have asked you the question, what inspired your decision to start a business? Um, but obviously, you've kind of given us an, <laughs> a peep into that. But in a BBC interview recently, you said that what sometimes gets in the way of starting a business is that people are too educated. Now, I was a bit taken aback by that statement. But just for our audience, can you explain further where you're coming from with that? Well, I think that sometimes we know too much and it holds yeah. us back. Mm-hmm. Right. So I always say that the best entrepreneurs didn't do an MBA. Right. Because when you do an MBA, you mm-hmm. over understand the issues. And exactly. to be honest, when you look at the challenges of starting a business, if you yeah. know how difficult it's going to be, if you know mm-hmm. how risky it's going to be, because you've mm-hmm. done all the calculations and, you know, you'll never do it. Exactly. So that's why I said that you could be too educated. When when I when I meant that is that you can you can be in a in a situation where there's just too much of uh, um, information that you have, mm-hmm. and exactly. then you become risk averse. Um, and yeah. so that's what I meant by that. It's sometimes you know when you're an entrepreneur, not knowing that you're right in front of an abyss and that you could jump, 
and yeah. you know your your life is over sometimes you know it, it's it's good not to know how close you are to death <laughs> or, um, no, that, and, and keep you alive and and, and so you know, when you see the abyss, you, you, you know, you build a parachute and you survive yeah, and thrive. Exactly. But, but yeah. if, you, if you know that sometimes it'll slow you down, you're like, oh, it's crazy, right? Because entrepreneurship yeah. does take a lot of crazy. <laughs> it, it does indeed. And I'll ask you a question around that, but that's like the next question after this one. So you also mentioned that being in tech, you must think as a business person. So there is this thing like people often think that, OK, I can write code, I can create programs. So getting into the tech business shouldn't be a problem because I've already got the necessary skills. You know, I can create the programs that I can then sell. But then how is it like, you know, it, it, does that mean that as a tech person, you have to, it's a balancing act. You need to have two skills as opposed to just the one. Well, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to create a product, then you yeah. don't need any business skills. But if you're trying to create a business out of that yeah. product, then exactly. you better have business skills, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, as, as some of our entrepreneurs that are, are more fo focused on the technology, um, yeah. you know, they don't, they, it's hard for them to, you know, understand the finance, the finance side. And, mm -hmm. you know, they go and sometimes try to raise money in front of investors, but they, they don't understand the business aspects. And that that is so critical in order to be a successful entrepreneur. You know, mm -hmm. and, and if you just are just want to do a product, perhaps, um, mm -hmm. and don't want the business side, perhaps then you could uh, join forces with other entrepreneurs um, and and who are more business minded and, exactly. and launch together, you know, yeah. um, and, and be a co-founder instead of just a sole founder and collaborate and co cooperate um, mm -hmm. and then build something together. But I, mm -hmm. I, I think if you really want to be successful, you have mm -hmm. to arm yourself and yeah. give yourself many of the tools um, to, that will allow you to be successful as possible. You know, I, 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 I'm still learning today. I learn every day. I, I spend hours and hours learning every week um, something new. I, I, I probably spend about 20 hours a week learning yeah. something new, like mm -hmm. learning it, it, sometimes about technology, sometimes about startups, sometimes yeah. about nutrition, you know, like yeah. all these things that interest me. I just, you know, I'm so curious and I just, I just love to just learn. And so yeah. I, I encourage entrepreneurs to learn as much as you can so that you yeah. have the, the right skills um, to be successful. Yeah. So I came across a quote in one of your blogs that read thus, um, to be an entrepreneur, you have to be crazy, which you already mentioned earlier. So this is that question. And to be an entrepreneur in Africa, you have to be raving mad. Now, um, I'm just going to give people a bit of a background to some things that you've been through and then link that to the question that I'm going to ask you. So having read your about your case with MTN Cameroon, who refused to pay your company upstack invoices of well over $3.2 million, one can understand the frustration. You even had to write an open letter to President Cyril uh, Ramaphosa of South Africa, and he was the then chairman of MTN at the time. Now, one would feel that you'll be spared the pangs of racism on the continent, but you, you mentioned in your, in your blog that statement was, statements were made to your team, such as, for Africans, we have already given you a lot of money, um, so that must have added insult to injury. So in your opinion, Rebecca, is it about a company culture or a people culture? Otherwise, why was MTN so belligerent in its treatment of you and your staff? I think there was a combination, you know, the, the, the people that were working on the team um, on the MTN side um, mm -hmm. were white South African um, and had a very um, low view of blacks in general. And so yeah. I think, you know, there was really definitely a, a, a conflict of culture um, yeah. because most of the people on our team um, mm -hmm. that were working on the project were African, black African and very successful. You know, exactly. these were brilliant, brilliant people um, mm -hmm. that had, um, you know, we only had four that, that were living in Cameroon. So mm -hmm. most of these were Africans that from the diaspora so for, that we brought in from our U.S. office or from our Paris office to work on the project. We had 23 people working on this project. And so oh, wow. and, and and so it was, you know, these are people that that, 
you know, have done multi-million dollar contracts before. You know, we we have customers, um, you know, across the world and had been and these are the same people that had been supporting these these other customers, um, much larger companies uh, than, than MTN. And so mm -hmm. it was kind of shocking to them. Like some of the questions were like, oh my goodness, you have a college degree? And this guy has a, you know, he had a, two master's degrees. This is the person they were asking, but to, oh, the wow. question too. And so I think that they, they had um, very low expectations and had a way of dealing with blacks in a business environment that, we had never seen. I'd never yeah. seen anything like that. And so yeah. I think that was that that cultural clash. There were other yeah. issues as well, um, other yeah. than it's not just racism. I mean, there was some, yeah. you know, there were some other issues as well. Um, yeah. But I, I just felt like, you know, I, I, one of the things that I've I've learned um, out of that uh, out of that experience, um, mm -hmm. and I and I shared it j recently again, but is that you know there is a very different business mindset um, in on the African continent versus yeah. out of Africa, right? So yeah. for instance, in, in the US where I started my company in 1999, mm -hmm. this is year 20, um, you know, it, it, there's a very win-win business culture, right? So mm -hmm. when you enter a business arrangement, um, it's it's a win, it, it, you, all, both parties are, accept, are expected to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. In our environment, um, particularly in Cameroon, and mm -hmm. not to be crude, but I've been known to use crudeness at, at times. <laughs> I know, it went to come to the yeah, 700 euro thing. So. Yeah. So one of us <laughs> is going mm -hmm. to get crude, and it's not going mm -hmm. to be me. And so yeah. everything is done in anticipation that the other person is going to behave in a dishonest way. Right. Exactly. So that's yeah. why we prepaid. Look at the phones. Right. So everybody is prepaid. They, nobody trusts anybody to pay a bill after the time. Nobody yeah. trusts anybody to respect a business agreement. Um, uh -huh. and, and I think it's very sad because, you know, it, it really constrains what business relationships can be. And I really mm -hmm. still believe um, uh -huh. in win-win. I really yeah. still believe that the best option for all of us is. Yeah. You know, to to trust, you know, and this element of trust in business is really critical. It's essential. Yeah, it is. And, you know, um, you mentioned that there were cultural crises apart from, you know, racism. I also got a hint of patriarchy from the lawyer because he was he came to your office and he goes, oh, your office is very well decorated. And it's like, oh, we're moving into new dicks, you know. And he said, Becky, you're a very yeah. smart girl. Drop this case when you took MTN to court. Like, how yeah. did that make you a woman? Well, I mean, you know, it's the women in tech thing or women as leaders. It's mm -hmm. we we get stuff like that, right? I mean, I I I I've had so many of those similar experiences, but I think it was. I will, never forget, I, was on, I will never forget the date. It was April eighth, two thousand and four. I will never yeah. forget the conversation because it came from someone whom I mm -hmm. thought I knew, and you know, we 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 weren't you know, close friends, but, but we moved around in the same social circles and yeah. there was no reason for that type of um, disrespect, you know, but yeah. I, I, this is something that we encounter as women day in, day out, is this idea yeah. that uh, we're decoration, right? And mm -hmm. I fight that with all my being, um, exactly. is that we, we are, we are, we're not, we can, we're not decoration. Um, <laughs> And and um, I, I I hope that that lawyer regrets um, having to having taken um, his client down a road that they cannot win. Um, yeah. No matter how long it's going to take, we are going to collect our money every <laughs> franc of it. So yeah. let no one believe for one second that it's over and I've let go. I've, I've no. <laughs> <laughs> I still have life um, before me, um, and even if I'm gone, those who will yeah. stay behind me will continue until we collect every cent of that, uh, of every franc of that money. We earned it, um, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, so I'm still hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, because you also made a statement related to that, how 
the issues that you had with MTN, how it delayed your company's progress in a way that, you know, can never be replaced. Um, so how did that affect your business? Because obviously you flew in all this stuff. Yeah, and all so of all of our, we, you know, um, because we had wanted to do such a good job, right? We wanted to make sure that this was our first large project on the African continent. We'd done exactly. some small projects, um, mm -hmm. uh, primarily as subcontractors um, mm -hmm. in other countries, but this was our first big project. And it was you were so invited to at that. You were I'm invited. Sorry? You were invited to tender for it at that because, and you came out, you were the best. You won yeah. outright. Yeah, yeah. And actually, they had flown out to the US um, yeah. more than once. They flew out twice. Um, they met with our customers. They met with our, our bankers. They, you know, they, they did a lot of due diligence um, ahead of time. They, they flew to yeah. Paris and yeah. met with our customers there and met our employees there. They flew to Canada where we had an office and met with our employees there, met with our customers there. And, and so you can't go through all of that due diligence um, yes. and then in the end not, not respect the commitment. I mean, if you look at the contract, they breached every single mm -hmm. article in the contract except for the company name, like everything. Exactly. And but that's not what this current, the lawsuit is about. It's like we just want to pay the bill, exactly. right? Pay the bill. That's it. Yeah. So pay us for the work that we did. But it was yeah. it, it was dramatic because we wanted to prove um, that that we we that we could do this in Africa. Yeah. We really put a lot of resources behind this, um, a yeah. lot of financial resources behind this, because, you know, when you have 23 people working on a project, you have to pay them, even though you're yeah. not getting paid. And the yeah. idea was, OK, we deliver, it works, then we get paid. Um, mm -hmm. And so there were two things that happened. One is that we stopped. Flu I started to lose focus. Yeah. Um, and because I was focused on issues and problems in Cameroon, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was not focusing on the growth that my business was going through here in the U.S. Exactly. And I was, uh, so, you know, that's one issue. The second issue is obviously financial, is that, yeah. you know, when you're pulling resources from left and right to uh -huh. finish a project, you're not uh, investing um, in the, you know, other opportunities. Um, exactly. And so I think it was very damaging from that respect. But I think the most severe damage that it did was to our momentum and yeah. to our, our self-esteem, not just mine as an individual, but ours as a company. It's like all of a sudden, you know, we were on such a trajectory of growth and yeah. of success that, uh -huh. it, that, that it almost made us question ourselves and say, maybe we're not good and maybe we, you know, wait. so, so it, it really took a lot of time um, for us to rebuild our self-esteem as a company um, yeah. to say, hey, you know, this is not about us and we still have um, innovation to create. We still have customers to serve. Um, and so we need to move forward as as a business um, and and th see things in a very positive way. I, I don't want it to be like, you know, it, it really did hurt our business. But in the end, yeah. it brought me back to Cameroon. Right. So mm -hmm. I hadn't I was living in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. you know, even through the time of the project. And I flew to Cameroon for a two week what I thought would be two weeks because I'm like, oh. You know, just call the CEO, we'll sit down and we'll work, work something out, right? Yeah. Um, it took two years. So I was actually staying in a hotel for two full years. And I was so naive. Like, every every week, I would think that, no, 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 by next week, it'll be settled, it'll be finished. And and that went on for, for two years. Um, and so it was, it was, it was really devastating from a business standpoint and, uh -huh. and, and also from a personal standpoint. But it also allowed me those years to spend with my dad, you know, because after the two years, I went back to the US, but I, I, I basically moved to Cameroon. I, I finally got a, an apartment. And so I was able yeah. to, because of that, spend a lot yeah. more time with my dad. Um, yeah. And really understand, have a much better understanding of the way things work in Cameroon. <laughs> I think some of us that that um, built our our careers in the in the in the diaspora, yeah. sometimes we have a very we look at Cameroon with through rose colored glasses, right? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we left 
the Cameroon that we left and the Cameroon that's there today is not no. the same Cameroon. And I always tell my, my, my brothers and sisters um, in a large sense that live in the diaspora is that, you know, I, I, I understand, and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about the Anglophone issues and the Southern Cameroon's issues. I, I, I totally understand and agree with the pain. Mm-hmm. Like, you would be surprised that it's not that black and white. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, there's been so many societal changes that are so profound in our country um, yeah. that are affecting all people of Cameroon. So, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a debate and it's a discussion that we need to have because I think that when we leave and we're gone for a long time and we only come back on holiday, because I went back to Cameroon frequently, right? Even yeah. when I was away, I went back frequently. In fact, that you know, in when I was starting my company I, uh, in in the in in Cameroon, when yeah. I opened my office in Cameroon, I would fly back mm-hmm. and forth all the time, and my yeah. parents, my family was there. I I, I thought I understood. I understood mm-hmm. nothing. You know, yes. I was I was I mean, Cameroon schooled me, right? Like you think <laughs> you're me, you're diaspora, you know, you're all this successful, you know, you're you're on the cover of American magazines, you know, because you're a successful old black woman in tech, and it was so rare back yeah. then. You can just imagine it's still rare today, but you can just imagine twenty years ago. It's just it was just it didn't happen. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's like you, you have you start to believe that, you know, you're something, you understand things and and mm-hmm. and so, but I, I had I had no clue. I had I was yeah. clueless. I understood nothing about the environment. And so I I always think that it's great. You know I I'm I feel blessed to have mm-hmm. had those challenges. Um, yeah. Because it, because it taught me so much about the core of our of our society, um, the core mm-hmm. of our people, and the the real difficulties that that mm-hmm. um, we as Cameroonians and Africans. Um, mm-hmm. have to go through and you know that's a very long answer to your but being an entrepreneur in Africa is you have to be raving mad um, mm-hmm. because everything is is twisted um, mm-hmm. and it's almost like you're, you're you're not just fighting to sell and to build your business you're mm-hmm. you're, you're fighting society that doesn't mm-hmm. recognize almost your right to elle pense même qu'elle est qui you know the, those types yeah. of things. Like it's unbelievable how how yeah. the, the the society as a whole is built mm-hmm. in such a way that it's not supportive of mm-hmm. people that want to take risks um, mm-hmm. and want to go into entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. So uh, talking about risk and entrepreneurship and the society, this brings me to the legal and regulatory framework in Africa in general governing the tech ecosystem. And Cameroon is just a special case, but just a bit of background. So Tunisia is the first country on the continent to address this when it directed a startup act in 2018. Though some Tunisians will tell you, yeah, more still needs to be done, of course, in implementing this. But some will say that this is low hanging fruit and the government needs to work in key areas such as providing a conducive business environment through tax breaks, funding and otherwise. So you've kind of highlighted some of your experience doing business in Cameroon, but what has been your experience with the uh, chairing active spaces, um, which, you know, uh, encourages tech entrepreneurs with the two hubs that you chair across Cameroon and also working with the African uh, Business Angels Network? Okay, so um, active spaces, which stands for African Center for Technology and Ventures. Um, We started first in Boya um, because Mm -hmm. as many, many people know, the uh, Boya has traditionally been the tech, the, the epicenter of yeah. the tech ecosystem in Cameroon. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it was the earliest to have startups to, and to mm-hmm. build itself as a community. You know, and yeah. I always say we call it Silicon Mountain, um, mm-hmm. but Silicon Mountain is not a location. And uh, Silicon <laughs> Mountain is, is a community of people mm-hmm. that are trying to build this tech ecosystem and recognize the need to um have a community and not just individual success. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's what's special about um, what we call Silicon Mountain, um, yeah. is that there's a real community um, mm-hmm. and a real ecosystem that's actually being built um, mm-hmm. rather than, you know, oh, 
there, there's one successful entrepreneur here and then there's one successful entrepreneur there and mm -hmm. it's slowly um we uh, the the the, the um, active spaces boy and that silicon mountain community um uh, colonize um the entrepreneurs in Douala yeah. <laughs> and adopted them, adopted the 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 uh, the Douala entrepreneurs into that community, and so we can yeah. talk about a larger technology ecosystem um, in 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 Cameroon. But you know, one thing that must be clear is that this this ecosystem is is centered in in Boya, our, our former capital, the former yeah. capital of the entire country. Um, yeah. it's still centered there. You know, the, the later, the, the problems that we've had um, within yeah. the last couple of years have obviously had a, a, a tremendous negative impact. Um, yeah. But, you know, in, in all, in, in it's still, there's a spirit there. There's a spirit um, yeah. um, in that environment that I think that that's what's going to make us succeed. Um, yeah. I also chair an organization called Afrolabs, and Afrolabs is the... Um, a network of, of hubs across the African continent. Um, mm -hmm. Afrolabs has 158 member hubs. Of course, uh, Active Spaces is a member across mm -hmm. 45 countries um, mm -hmm. and supporting a community of over 500,000 entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so I talk and I see entrepreneurs very regularly and, and, and you know, the same problems that we complain about in Cameroon They'll complain mm -hmm. about even in Tunisia. They'll complain about in Egypt. They'll complain about in South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we laugh because I'm like, you, you see all these programs. And when you listen to politicians, you know, mm -hmm. I was recently in a country. I won't name it because I don't want to get in trouble. I get in too much trouble already. But I was recently yeah. in a country and I was hearing their very their second in command in the country um, saying, you know, very proudly, like all these things are doing for the tech entrepreneurs <laughs> and yeah. with some entrepreneurs from that country. And they're like, what country is he talking about? You know, so <laughs> there's, there's, there's um, the, the, um, the language and, you know, what the, the politicians are saying and claiming, and then there's the reality on the ground, but there's yeah. definitely, and I can see it, there's definitely an effort. Um, on on the part of some government to improve yeah. the environments because they recognize how powerful technology can be and how, how transformative technology can be for their mm -hmm. own economy. So don't mm -hmm. fight, you know, what is, it's like killing the golden goose, right? Exactly, so, yeah. So, so it's, 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 some countries have recognized the need. Mm -hmm. Now, amongst those have, that have recognized it, and where there's some political will, yeah, the implementation is still mm -hmm. problematic, right? Yeah. So, so we need both the political will, mm -hmm. um, positive policies, yeah. and proper implementation. Um, yeah. So, I think that this is this is you know we need to get all of three of those um, combined and. And if I have one message to convey to African governments, even the mm -hmm. spies from A2D, I would say that um, talk to the entrepreneurs. You would be very surprised that no one from the Cameroon government has ever, ever spoken to me about mm -hmm. technology enabling environment in Cameroon, ever. It's never happened. As a matter of fact, we have never had a high level official visit active spaces either mm -hmm. Boyan or Douala, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so they, they, they sit and they create these policies and some of them are well-intentioned. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, I'm not even, you know, like it's not everything they do that's bad. It's like they're really trying in some, yeah. in some respects, but what they're doing and their plans are so ill-conceived because mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't really answer the problems that we're having. Um, mm -hmm. And so, they, you know, you can't sit in your tower, in your ivory tower in, mm -hmm. in, in Yaoundé and then decide without talking to us what we need, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I really encourage more dialogue, um, mm -hmm. even with people that you may not like so much. 
<laughs> I really encourage um, dialogue, and I and I'm I'm opening. I'm saying it officially and openly. I'm open. You know, I'm open to having these discussions with uh -huh. any member of the Cameroon government on how we can be the next Tunisia. Um, yeah. It's 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 not something that costs. You know, it's not about money. You would be oh. so surprised that we don't need a budget for this, which is no. probably why we're not having it. <laughs> because mm -hmm. if there's no budget, nobody wants to get involved in it because you don't manage money and you're mm -hmm. not interested. So yeah. we really, we really, you know, there are so many things that can be done that are that don't involve cost. Um, yeah. that would really improve our, our business environment um, yeah. and especially for, for technology and entrepreneurs. Yeah, but one can comment and say that uh, the way our political uh, lives in Africa is run is very much rent-seeking. So unfortunately for us, until we have those leaders who are looking more to make change than to line up their pockets with lots more money, um, we're going to still have the struggle. But anyways, we are going to keep a positive mindset, like you said, so let's keep reinforcing that message. Now, social media, Rebecca, is reinforcing political power structures in Africa more than it's challenging them. I read yeah, I from it. I saw that study, um, yeah, that, that, that article in, in exactly. courts. I, yeah, I, so controversial. I saw that. I'm not sure that I agree. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that I'm in complete agreement with them. I think that there could be an argument for against this because you find countries such as Tanzania and Uganda moving to tax social media. So carry on. What are your thoughts on this? I think that um, social media has been extremely powerful um, yeah. on the continent, on the entire continent. You know, yeah. you can't and Obviously, and, and for many Africans, it's been the first time that they could express themselves freely to yeah. a large group of people. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time. And so uh, this is the first time that Africans could say, hey, oh, by the way, I don't like you. My I don't like the president, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like this freedom, this newfound freedom. Um, mm -hmm. That, that governments themselves have not been comfortable with. Yeah. And so they, they've managed it very poorly. And, you know, we've seen that, um, the, the, you know, the, all the internet cut, shutdowns. You know, I think it's out of fear. You know, yes. governments are, not, are shutting the internet down, not just to assert power, but because mm -hmm. they're, they're fearful. This is mm -hmm. something that they don't even understand. You know, I think, you know, you know, how many, how many of our politicians use social media, use it, really use it to communicate and have these dialogues and have these conversations that are sometimes very hard. And um, how many, you know, so, so, you know, we're, 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 we're I think they're, they're just fearful of it. And um, mm -hmm. they, they use it for marketing and selling their messages and things like that. We, we saw about the Facebook um the, the Facebook uh, scandals um, mm -hmm. where uh, where for Afro, where there was some advertising and some content and some fake accounts that mm -hmm. were um, supporting um, particular presidential candidates um, yeah. in, in in elections and you know so they're trying to use and manipulate social media for their mm -hmm. own needs but they're doing so without understanding social media you know yeah. and I think that. That, that's why I. That, that's where I disagree with that article. Is that um, they, they're trying to control and to be um, to use it as their tool, but I don't think they're being, being very successful at it. To be honest, I think that if they really spent some time on social media, they would understand that whatever they're doing is not working. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we've already established, um, you know, that the legal and regulatory structures on the continent do create a lot of challenges, especially for investors. But you had an interview with um, Andile Masuko on African Tech Roundup. Wow, and you went way back in your research. <laughs> yeah, 
And you explained your annoyance at foreign aid money flooding Africa's tech scene, as seen with uh, Mark Zuckerberg's support of Andela, not as a business investment, but kind of aid funding of sorts. So, uh, bef and this was well before the Jumia is not Africa, your Jumia is not Africa hashtag that went viral. And just for a bit of background, so there was this other gentleman that came by the name of TMS Ruger. He weighed in and he actually showed proof that Jumia changed their legal form to become a German stock corporation from 31st of January uh, 2019 on Twitter this year. So which means they actually were going on the stock exchange markets. They were doing the IPO when they had already declared that they were no longer an African company. So they I told you never, they were never an African company. I mean, <laughs> they moved. No, no, no. I, I mean, I hope that that's clear. Jumia started in Berlin. It mm -hmm. didn't start anywhere on the African continent. And we can talk about that a little bit. I didn't want to interrupt you because the, the other topic, which is very related to why the Jumia is not African went viral is, is mm -hmm. about funding for African startups. We have a problem. Mm -hmm. And there was a study done by Village Capital, an American firm, um, that said that 93% of the funding that went to East African startups, I think uh, two years ago, went mm -hmm. to foreign founders. Oh, la, la. And, it, and, and you can look at, there's, um, it's been going around, there's a, there's a report um, that was put together by someone that, that, that works for GSMA, but um, that, that where he listed the startups that have raised more than, um, that, that have raised more than a million dollars so far in 2019. Wow. And you would really see um, how many of those founders are not from Africa. Um, and so we still have this issue of the, the largest amount of funds are going to um, foreign startups and not African founders. Um, yeah. And that's why I have such an issue with this Jumia um portraying itself as an African startup. You know, yeah. being an African entrepreneur, and we just had that conversation, is so incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. I mean, you know, just to start a business and then, you know, imagine trying to raise funding and then, you know, you don't look, I don't look like what a successful tech entrepreneur looks like. You know, everybody's talking about, oh, the next Mark Zuckerberg. Well, you know, and when they are looking for the next Mark Zuckerberg, they're looking for somebody that physically looks like him. They're looking for a white man, you yes. know. And so it's very difficult to break that and to say, hey, by the way, there are um, successful businesses, successful entrepreneurs that, um, that don't look like Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a battle. And then you have two French guys uh -huh. being hired by a company called Rocket Berlin. Yes. So Rocket Berlin, uh -huh. uh, Rocket Internet, sorry. I call it Rocket Berlin is their Twitter handle. Very, so yeah. Rocket Internet is uh -huh. in the business of launching copycats of companies across yeah. the world. Right. Yeah. So... Uh -huh. They launch brands, they create their brands in Berlin, and then mm -hmm. they decide, okay, we're going to launch in this country, in that country, in that country, you know, mostly Latin America, Asia, and more recently, Africa. Mm -hmm. And so that's how Jumia started, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what they did is they launched a number of brands like Kemu, uh, Lamudi, Carmudi, uh, Jovago. And those were not African-specific brands. Those are mm -hmm. brands that they launch across the world. And as a matter of fact, if you go and research and look, you will mm -hmm. find that some of those brands exist mm -hmm. today um, mm -hmm. with their original name. Mm -hmm. So then um, they decide to launch some of those brands on the African continent. And it's yeah. not as if they launched from one particular country in Africa. You know, mm -hmm. so... Rocket Berlin hired two guys as co-founders, right? Yes, two Nigerian gentlemen. Yeah. No, 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 no. French guys, white guys. Okay. Co-founders, right? Yeah, Rocket but, Berlin yeah. hired okay. two guys in Germany, but that worked out of a, an office in Paris as okay. co-founders. And yeah. if you want, you can go to the Rocket Internet website 
and you can mm -hmm. apply to be a co-founder for one of their companies. It's a mm -hmm. job. It's mm -hmm. not an African, it's not a founder. It's not somebody that created the business. So, mm -hmm. and Rocket Berlin, Rocket Internet, provides mm -hmm. the funding, provides the business plan, provides, so all they're doing is going and open an office or opening a subsidiary. And oh. so in that, they hired co-founder, they hired people to launch their companies in various African countries. Wow. Including Nigeria, including yeah. Cameroon, but it wasn't like they, they hired guys in, in Nigeria that then opened the rest of the African, no. Oh. So, so you have, some that were African um, that they hired to start their business, their brand, so launch a brand on the continent. Uh -huh. But you have white guys, like you have in 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 um, in Nigeria. Some uh -huh. of the brands were led by white guys. They weren't led by locals, right? So, and it, it was like that in all countries. In Cameroon, uh -huh. it was a young a French lady. I mean, she must have been like twenty-two years old. First real job um, that launched it out of my conference room. So I know exactly how it works. You know, I invited oh, oh. her to, to start. I was trying to help her and support her um, because I knew Rocket Internet and I thought that it would be a, a great infusion to, to have a Rocket subsidiary in Cameroon because mm -hmm. it would create competition and, you know, buzz and, and, you know, our other entrepreneurs would see how the Germans do it. So uh -huh. it was never, and that's why I, it's clear that it had never been African. So they yes. moved their headquarters. Um, uh -huh. This is the African operations, used to be called Africa Internet Group. Um, uh -huh. They were based in Paris. Uh -huh. They hired from Paris. Um, uh -huh. And they controlled and managed everything from Paris. And then uh -huh. they moved their headquarters from Paris to Dubai. So at no point has Jumia ever had a group level office mm -hmm. on the African continent. Right. Because yeah. I remember covering this story when Jumia just started in Africa and then there were the because we usually at the time I worked at Box Africa and then where we usually got our press from uh, Reuters and the press releases were all saying that the founders were these two Nigerian gentlemen mm -hmm. and that they're planning to expand mm -hmm. in Egypt and I was yeah. like, wow, this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that, that, first of all, they were talking about Jumia and Nigeria only, right? Yeah. Um, even when those two worked um, in 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 Jumia, Nigeria, they didn't they did not work. They didn't have any influence or any say on any of the activities for Jumia anywhere else on the continent. Yeah. And we yeah. call it Jumia because in 2016 they were having they were really struggling with all of these various brands um Kemu, Lamudi, Carmudi, etc and decided mm -hmm. to consolidate all of the brands under the name Jumia only mm -hmm. on the African mm -hmm. continent so the mm -hmm. other brands continued elsewhere but on in mm -hmm. for, for their african operations they decided mm -hmm. to brand everything under Jumia and then as you saw when they launched decided to launch their IPO they then registered Jumia group instead of mm -hmm. Africa Internet group so yeah. that's the, the change. They didn't really change the location of their headquarters. They were always mm -hmm. registered as a German company. Oh, wow. That's pretty interesting because uh, one would never have, uh, you know, thought of all these background things until your hashtag came out. I've always thought Jumia was African. So mm -hmm. when I was reading through the messages and seeing all the tweets and seeing people adding to it, I was just like, wow, okay. Uh, this yeah, is and, and I think that, 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 you know, everybody's, uh, you know, some people were saying that, well, you know, here... Why don't we just take credit for this being an African company that, that launches an IPO on Wall Street? You know, shouldn't we just be happy about that? But knowing how Jumia functions mm -hmm. and knowing how badly they're managed, mm -hmm. um, they, they raised 800 million US dollars. Can you imagine wow. that? 800, 800 million dollars. And they have had losses in excess of one billion dollars in losses, losses. Yeah. So if this is not what an African startup, a successful uh, African startup looks like, we have mm -hmm. successful African startups. They don't mm -hmm. lose a billion US dollars after raising 800 million. They don't, um, mm -hmm. they, we would never be allowed to as <laughs> African, right? Oh, no. We would never be allowed to raise that kind of money and then lose yeah. a billion dollars and then go around saying, oh, we're successful. <laughs> I yeah. just wouldn't happen. But two white okay. guys, they can do that and they get away with it. 
um, mm-hmm. using the Africa brand. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 that that's that's yeah. I mean, some some people would argue that okay, you know that Jumia perhaps you or generally other companies that are launched in Africa by Europeans, they might be anti registering them in Africa, given that the legal structures iron and regulated structures are not that very strong so wouldn't it be understandable that what works best for your business is what you spring for in terms of i have have absolutely no problem with them being registered in germany yeah no problem whatsoever i do have a problem with them not having a single african on their group management team Mm -hmm. i do have a problem with them not having a single group office on the african Mm -hmm. continent I mm-hmm. do have a problem with them not having a single African engineer on their team. They decided mm-hmm. to create and to build their whole engineering um, center in mm-hmm. Portugal. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with all of that. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with them doing all that and then coming back and saying, oh, we're African. What's African about you other than your customers? Tell us. Mm-hmm. The technology is not created in Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, the technology... It's not the, the, the strategies are not decided upon in Africa. It's mm-hmm. not managed from Africa. What is African other than the customer base? You know, mm-hmm. what is African about Jumia? You know, because they sell to us, so does Techno. Techno <laughs> is a, a telephone brand. It's yeah. exclusively for the African continent. Yeah. You can't buy Techno anywhere else in the world. But I don't think that Techno would go around saying they were African. They're Chinese. You know, mm-hmm. it's the same business model. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think it's fine if they want to do business in Africa, but don't claim to be an African startup. It's just the most ridiculous thing. Yeah. So some would highlight that, okay, uh, maybe Jumia's attitude also equally, you know, points to another African problem. Take Andela, for example. They take the best, you know, developers. And when those developers get enough experience, then they move abroad to countries like Canada, where they get more pay. And um, actually, I came across someone who has a startup here teaching like Africans how to code and do that. But then they become reluctant to do that because they then say that when they train Africans to work in Africa and they gain the skills, then they sell them to, you know, Western uh, companies at a cheaper rate and then they lose a job from out here. So what are your thoughts on this? My thoughts are that if the environment's obviously on the African continent. Uh, first of all, that, that excuse as far as hiring, we have enough engineers on the African continent that would be able to support a, a Jumia operation, right? So that's not the issue here. Um, mm-hmm. And if they wanted, they could go sign a contract with Andela and I'm sure Andela would, 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 <laughs> would be happy to take there um, and do the engineering. But mm-hmm. I think it goes beyond that. I think when we, when I, and bring people into my company. I have I have um, about 15 interns starting in Douala on Monday. Um, oh, wow. I hope they're known for me. <laughs> when, when we do that, we don't do it because we expect them to stay with us. You know, I've had hundreds of Africans that have come through Upstech and we call them alumni. You know, they've worked some for shorter periods, some for very long periods, but they're mm-hmm. all part of, for me, when they go mm-hmm. out and they go on and they're successful, wherever they are, whatever yeah. they're doing, I'm proud of them because I yeah. feel like I contributed to that. I don't want to feel like, oh, yeah, I trained you. And so you have to stay. If you can do better, go do better. You mm-hmm. know, I will train the next person. It's fine. Yeah. I, I think we shouldn't get get bogged down in the, the impression that, you know, we have to hold um, and, and, and keep these young people. You know, Mm -hmm. I want them to grow and develop and be the best they can be wherever that might be, even Mm -hmm. if it's not with me. Right. Right. And so I'm not investing in them only for for me, but I'm investing in these young people so that they can do for Africa. Um, And, you know, and and yeah, some will leave, you know, because it's better for them. But when they go, they're still African, aren't they? Right. (laughs) And if whether they're in Canada or yeah. in, you know, in, in the U.S. or in Europe, they're yeah. still African. And so they're still carrying our brand as a successful engineers. And so I think that that's still positive. And, and, and I will never stop um, supporting young people that want to learn how to get involved in technology 
whether it's through one of the organizations I'm involved in or one if, or my company. And I will never feel like they've, they've, if they leave that I've lost something. I think the world gains something. Um, and I think that if we look at it that way, then, you know, we won't worry about, you know, coming and leaving. And, you know, look, look at if the conditions are good enough and they can support their families, more, more, most Africans want to stay. They want to stay home. Like yeah. this impression that everybody just wants to go. It's, a, it's not the right. It's not the truth. That's not mm -hmm. what I see. What mm -hmm. I see is people sometimes becoming so frustrated with mm -hmm. the conditions um, mm -hmm. under which they have to, to live that they want to leave. But mm -hmm. it's not if you have a good job and you're working as in, 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 a, in your field as an engineer, mm -hmm. your, your, your first reaction is not to take off and go to Canada. You know, yeah. so so I, I, I yeah, I'm very positive And I, I, I you know, I think for donner sans compter, I, you know, <laughs> is, is, what, is what they say in French is it is if you're going to invest in 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 young people, you're doing it for them. You're not doing it for you. Right. OK. Yeah. So I've got a question here, Rebecca, from one of our audience members called Botti. So Botti is asking. So uh to build a company, you have to have the right partners, like you said. So where and how did you find yours for, for active spaces? And how did you then know that it would work out with them in the long term? Okay, so um, in our um, lingo, we call them founders versus um, partners, co-founders. Um, mm -hmm. But I, 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 And this is true, not just in business, but also in personal relationships. You have to have common values. What is your value system, right? Mm -hmm. What what um, are your principles? What is what are is there integrity, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you look for in somebody that you're going to start either an organization with or mm -hmm. a business with. Um, mm -hmm. And and so you know, active spaces. I was very blessed um, years yeah. ago. I was in, in you know to have met. It's an, um, uh, an American guy called Bill Zimmerman. Um, mm -hmm. There's Valerie Colong. There's so many people that were involved. Um, Ebot Tabi. So many people that were involved very early on um, in, in trying to take this vision and, and make a reality out of it. You know, I'm one of those people that I, I can think through and, pl and, and plan things, but I really, really, really need people around me that are going to carry it out um, mm -hmm. and do the day to day. Um, mm -hmm. and like, like we talk about African Business Angels Network, you know, what we what we did is we created. And again, these are like minded individuals that mm -hmm. share values and principles mm -hmm. and are willing to come together for good. You mm -hmm. know, when you have that kind of group together, it's an unbeatable team. And and what you can accomplish with people like that is is amazing things. Right. You can just go beyond what anybody expects because. You really share the same, um, the the same, I guess, passion for doing yeah. things um, yeah. properly, you know. Um, and so, yeah. So I think that 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 that's what I look for. I have my co-founder here for one of my businesses. I don't know if you can see this, but this is IO Spaces, um, which is one of my companies here in the U.S. And yeah. I have my co-founder who's here. His name is Leslie Tita. He's from Cameroon, um, yeah. and I met. And I met Leslie when I was mentoring him. Um, oh, he wow. had a startup, and um, and I met Leslie. And um, yeah, so he came to the U.S. and he 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 had this idea and he had the vision. And mm -hmm. he talked to me about it, and I decided a to invest in it. And then now I'm I'm so involved that that I'm I'm he's considering me his his co-founder, and I'm I'm grateful for that. Um, but, but yeah, so, so it's really important, but Leslie is like a brother to me. You know, we, we really share mm -hmm. this passion and yeah. the, the same values. We're very different. We're so different. Sometimes we can <laughs> fight day in, day out. Yeah. I mean, we, but we can argue, but yeah. fight is a big word. It's argue and, 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 but I think we're very complimentary. Um, yeah. and and I would say the same thing for all the other organizations or uh, businesses that I'm involved in. The people yeah. that are running the businesses on a daily basis or the organizations when there are a lot of nonprofits are, mm -hmm. are, are people that, that share 
the same passions, share the same value system um, as, as I do. Okay, so we've got a lot and lots of uh, comments coming through here, Rebecca. So we'll just read them very quickly so that you can hear some of them. Um, so Botty, that you just responded to a question. Botty, I hope you got that response there. So Jumia is not African. Those people have always wanted to use our name to shine without dealing with us directly. Uh, colonial mindset, she goes. And then we have a, a Bacham Santa Emene who says, a country's richest lies in the citizens. Who will tell them? And um, we've got uh, Simon Munzu. Simon Munzu is actually watching it, he says. So oh, my God. Hi. <laughs> I'm so <glad>. <laughs> So um, we have Bamai Namata, who is saying that Jumia will be making real African entrepreneurs be feeling like they can't raise capital. Horrible. Yeah. And um, someone here is saying, G. Kings is saying, we need a Paul Kagame. And um, Asheri Meredith is responding. Hitting <laughs> King saying you can be one, <laughs> and, <laughs> and King's response I'm trying to, my best. Um, so we have Mbole Ekane who's saying, but as Africans, what can we do? Uh, what can we do to the same thing as Jumia? Why is it always foreigners that are winning big time in Africa? We have a plethora of techies and business people. Africans are very cursed. We're not uh, cursed. We're not cursed. I, I hear you, and I, I hear you, and it could be very discouraging. Um, mm -hmm. But what can we do is we have to start talking about it. That's the that's yeah. the beginning, right? Is to start having this conversation. You know, some of these very difficult conversations, people don't want to have the conversation. That's what no. I'm here for, right? That's 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 my 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 role that I've given myself. It's like where people don't want to tread because maybe it's too hot to tread yeah. there. I'm yeah. I'm ready to tread there. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, maybe the Jumia is not African, has kind of raised awareness for this problem that we have about African founders not getting funded. I'm in, in, in a couple of different WhatsApp groups um, that where there are a lot of African investors, most of which, unfortunately, are not African. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, yeah. part of our problem is that Africans are not investing in Africans. You know, exactly. and that's the reason we created the African Business Angels Network. Um, mm -hmm. The African a, a business angel is somebody that's taking their own, you know, personal money and investing in an early stage business. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's how Silicon Valley developed. You know, mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg didn't go to a VC. He got angel investment. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is encourage age, uh, uh, young, I mean, encourage Africans. Mm -hmm. to invest in African and, yeah. um, and, and, and help them. And so create a framework within which they can do this. Um, yeah. So African Business Angels Network has been encouraging the creation of angel networks across the continent. And mm -hmm. there are so many new angel networks that were created only in 2019, especially in Francophone Africa. It's been wonderful to yeah. see that you have these, these, these individuals that have a little bit of extra money and have decided that they're going to entrust that money to young startup entrepreneurs. Exactly. And um, I'm seeing the question about the Nigerian. Yeah. Oh, so they they created the generator. All oh, that is amazing. Yeah. You know, I, that was amazing. I, I saw that. Um, mm -hmm. I tweeted about it. It is, you know, the, so you have this, this young man in Nigeria. Mm -hmm that created yeah. in Nigeria a generator that mm -hmm. functions with water as power. Yes. Wow, what ingenuity. But, you know, I see that ingenuity so often. Um, I'm involved as a judge um, on, on the various competitions. We have one um, that, that's, that's out of the UK with the Royal Academy for Engineering called the Africa Prize for Engineering. The innovation mm -hmm. that we see these young people and what they do with nothing. These mm -hmm. like, like they, they, they can do so much with nothing and yeah. goodness gracious, we need to support them. And so that's yeah. why it's so important to create a framework because some people want to invest and they don't know how, it's like exactly. they don't know how it works, right? They don't know the right. mechanics of, of it. And that's yeah. why we create these angel networks. These angel yeah. networks are there to, um, to accompany the, uh, the investors themselves 
um, mm -hmm. it's an association of investors, really, just what it is, like an investment club, right? So you get together, yeah. you look at various deals, and if you don't know how it works, somebody else knows how it works, and you know, together you decide to put pool some money and put into a, a, a startup, and we have to start doing that because we can't sit back and complain about the Jumyas that raised, you know, eight hundred million dollars while we raised nothing, and and then not encourage and then not have Africans invest in Africans. And so I think that's the first solution. The other yeah. one is to, there are blind spots um, mm -hmm. that investors have. You know, mm -hmm. an investor that's in Silicon Valley that mm -hmm. wants to invest in Africa mm -hmm. still has their, what a successful entrepreneur looks like. You can't change that. You know, even black people in America have a problem raising money. It's not just Africans, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're a double victim because, you know, you're, you're, you're a foreigner. You're a foreigner, you know? Yeah. So all that added to all the things that don't look like success mm -hmm. um, and all the, the other startups that look like success that are right next to them where the founder looks like them, you know, mm -hmm. I think that those are some of the things that, that create issues. But I think we first need to, to bring up the, um, that we first need to raise awareness and start having the conversations with those investors um, uh, and say, hey, by the way, you may have a blind spot here. Um, mm -hmm. Do you realize that all of these startups that you've invested in in Africa don't have African founders, you know, that, those types of conversations need to happen. And I think that's the beginning. Yeah, I have a comment here from Bole Kane who says, you're right. I believe those who usually do uh, startup businesses are from the diaspora, but businesses cannot depend on them alone. The next problem is that most Africans in Africa don't have enough money to invest. So it's like a cash 22. We've heard problems about the banks where they don't give you any line of credit because you don't have a land title to give as collateral or you don't have someone to back you up. So how does an entrepreneur who doesn't go have any money, because even angel networks would require you to give some sort of uh, some sort of collateral for them to be able to give you their hand. No no no, 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 no. Okay, so no, it's completely equity. These are not loans, right? Okay. So an angel investor, mm -hmm. it, and it, it's incredibly risky for the angel investor. There's no collateral. What mm -hmm. you're doing is getting equity. You're getting a, shares in the company. Generally, okay. we as uh, African Business Angels Network. In, mm -hmm. in the training that we give investors, say that mm -hmm. this could never exceed more than 15% of the business, of the shares in the business. So what yeah. we're saying is that, okay, we're going to give you $10,000, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to take 5% of your company, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, something like that. So we, mm -hmm. we it's generally negotiated, but it's not a loan. And mm -hmm. these angel investors are could lose everything. Which yeah. is why I, you know, it's entrepreneurs and startups also need to better prepare themselves. It's part of the conversation we had earlier, where you have somebody that has this great idea, it's great concept, and goes to an investor with this idea and thinks that the investor is going to invest in the idea. My mm -hmm. friend, that money that I earned through my blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. You want me to just hand it to you, right? <laughs> You have yeah. nothing. You have no product. You have no, no knowledge. You, you don't have any experience building a company. Yeah. And you just want me to just hand over the money. God. So <laughs> I think, I think what, what, what we want entrepreneurs to do uh -huh. in order to be prepared for uh -huh. the uh, funding that comes, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Is we want them to have a product. Don't come to us with an idea. We don't fund ideas. We mm -hmm. fund businesses. And okay. so if you don't have a product that we can test and that we can see, does this mm -hmm. thing work? Mm -hmm. Don't come for funding, mm -hmm. right? You're not ready for the funding at that point. You're going mm -hmm. to have to struggle a little bit more Maybe yeah. find some friends to support you and help you build your product. Once mm -hmm. your product is ready, mm -hmm. then you still have to have a plan. 
How are you going to monetize your product? How are you going to make money on the product? Mm -hmm. You know, all of those things need to be thought through and mm -hmm. prepared so that mm -hmm. when we come to you, it's like, what are you just creating a product because you think it's fun? Or is there a real problem um, that you're bringing a solution to? So all yeah. of those things need to be thought through. We mm -hmm. support entrepreneurs by helping mm -hmm. them put this together. Yeah. Through these tech hubs, mm -hmm. right? So all the tech hubs that are members of Acro Labs, that's what Active Spaces does. Mm -hmm. Is Active Spaces takes you, the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You have a product. We help you and we support you by helping you build a a, 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 a real business plan. When we say business plan, we're not talking about a 20 page document. I hate those, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about what is your business model? How mm -hmm. are you going to make money from this product? And so, yeah. and we do it for free, by the way. Oh, wow. Right? This is not Active Spaces is an, an association, it's a nonprofit organization, as are mm -hmm. the, the vast majority of tech hubs across the continent. There was a report that came out um, earlier this year that pointed to about over 600 tech hubs on the African continent. Those mm -hmm. that are a member of Afrolabs, as I said, there are about 158, there are 158 now, um, um, 45 countries. Mm -hmm. Most of those hubs are nonprofits and most of them are there just to support the entrepreneur. You know, they're funded like, like people like me, um, mm -hmm. some, some of them are funded by corporations. Some of them are funded by foundations. And yeah. their, their sole purpose is to support the entrepreneur and help them be a success. Oh, wow. That's, all, that's it. There's like, there's, there's no hidden agenda. There's no, that's it. And so mm -hmm. what we do is we provide an environment that's physical. Yeah. So you can yeah. come and work out of our, our two centers, the one in Boya and then the one in Douala. And yes. you can come and work out of there. You have an internet connection. You, you know, so, and, and then you have access to all the support and all the training that we mm -hmm. provide our entrepreneurs. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want, you can even enter our incubation program. And mm -hmm. our incubation program is much more um, intensive. Um, mm -hmm. And if you, it, and all it is is to give you tools. We can't mm -hmm. say whether or not you're going to be successful. Right. We can't, yeah. we can't, but we can say, OK, these are the tools that will help you be the most successful you can be. And yeah. these are, are are this is how you can present your business to an investor in such mm -hmm. a way that the investor will want to put their money in and will trust you with it. Because mm -hmm. we know that it will be years and years and years before we ever see any result from that investment. Um, yeah. And, so you know, so. That's part of the, the beauty and the, the, the why technology hubs are so important in Africa. Because in the U.S., in Europe, you can start your business out of your parents' house, right? Yeah. The basement. You know, everybody's like, oh, we started in the garage and everything like that. But we don't have those. You know, no. you don't have an Internet connection in your house. You don't yeah. have the parents that can, you know, help you write your plan. And so I think that that's the role that that. Um, that, that tech hubs ha, ha, have in, in, in Cameroon is, is really being a community center supporting mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. And we're doing this across the continent. And, and as I said, we have a community of over 500,000 um, entrepreneurs that are supported through this network. Okay. So Rebecca, I'll just quickly read this comment, ask you one quick question. We can go to the other part of um, this um, interview. So, right. We have another from Botti who's saying, right. So we from the African population in foreign countries need to mature enough, need to, uh, to refuse to send money to the family for gifts, but rather for investment. In 2018, we sent around 60 million US dollars via Western Union. We need to use that money to build, not consume. So that follows with a question then now uh, from um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Kinder Bueno. Rebecca, is there a network or group of mentorship where people from the diaspora can be supported in terms of building something on the continent? I think that um, that's, a key, that's a key issue is, is how can we leverage um, the money from the diaspora um, mm -hmm. and build businesses with it? So mm -hmm. one, one interesting thing that we found is, is that 
in in princess in, in our environment in Cameroon, we have a few in our group of, of Cameroon Angels Network. But what we've discovered is that we have um, like-minded Cameroonians that are sitting in Silicon Valley and want to invest. They just don't know how. And so we're we're, we're serving as that conduit between them and the startup, so that we're on the ground. We can see, um, we can see these entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. And we can touch them, and we can see their progress which it's very difficult to follow um, a startup when you're located overseas, right? So, so it, you know, sometimes you send your money and these guys, they take off with the money. And, and then, you know, so <laughs> it's true, it happens, <laughs> but unfortunately. So, yeah. you know, there's also this issue of trust. Um, and so I think what that's why I so believe in, in structuring our ecosystem. I really mm -hmm. think it's key. I think that, you know, relationships between business angels and tech hubs, we're all doing mm -hmm. the same thing, right? In the mm -hmm. end, we want entrepreneurs to succeed, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I think that what's really essential is that we create these relationships. And I'm very proud that this is something that we'll be announcing um, very soon um, mm -hmm. is between Afrolams um, yeah. the, and a ABAN, the African Business Angels Network, we mm -hmm. have created a program called yeah. Catalyst to mm -hmm. support um, startups in Africa and support the angel investors because mm -hmm. it's so difficult to be an angel investor. There are so few angel investors that we really want to encourage it. And so what we've done is that we've created a program through which um, we will, we're raising a pool of money Mm -hmm. um, that will be, you know, kept and managed by Aban and Afrilams. Um, mm -hmm. Aban um, uh, is a Mauritius uh, entity. It's a nonprofit foundation. Afrilabs is also a foundation. Um, our office uh, for Afrilabs is in Abuja, Nigeria. Yeah. And so what, what those two teams have come together and done is create this program. It's like, okay, how can we work together? And yeah. so in order to support the entrepreneur, support the hub and support the angel investor. We have this matching program. We're raising money that will be managed at the level of uh, the African Business Angels Network. And yeah. when a, an angel investor decides to invest in a startup yeah. that is in a hub that's a member of Afrolabs, you see, we're trying to keep the structure. Yes. Then the pool will match that investment. So let's mm -hmm. say me, I, I only have $5,000, right? The startup needs more. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, you, what, what this pool would do is then match the amount of money that the angel investor is putting in mm -hmm. and um, into the, the startup. There's a, there's a very small percentage that goes to the hub because yeah. we want the hubs to track the progress for the startup and report back to the program report back to the investor. And so yeah. this is a program that I think will be really, will really encourage angel investment, will really support the startups and support the hubs at the same time. Um, and mm -hmm. we're hoping to announce it within the next, I would say the next couple of weeks. Okay, so a quick question. Somebody is asking, how do they become an angel investor with ABAN? Um, so ABAN is a network of networks. But ABAN can help you and support you in creating a network in your country if you don't have one. Um, okay. Or even if there is one and you want to create your own, I mean, the, the more the merrier. We have two angel networks that I know of in Cameroon, formal mm -hmm. angel networks. There may be some informal ones. Um, mm -hmm. But in other countries, there are many. In some countries, there are none. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you go to abanangels.org, mm -hmm. um, there's the contact information there. Um, they will tell you if there's already a network in your country. Um, yeah. If there's not a network, they will encourage you and, and support you in creating a network in your country. Okay. Thank you for that, Rebecca. So let's go to the second part of this. We're coming back to Cameroon now. So um, and just to, to highlight one thing, I realized you're, you're, you're very bilingual. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I noticed that when you brought up the issue of the Chris de Devis, I didn't even know what Chris de Devis was before I understood the currency crisis. My French is, uh, if I could put in French, and uh, but my French is not so good. So I was quite uh, taken with how bilingual you are. But but how did you keep up your French being in America? <laughs> well, I mean, I went to French school, right? Oh, so, 
Um, and I think that that puts me in a very unique situation because I came from a very Anglophone activist um, home. Yeah. And I spoke English at home. That's why I have an American accent. It's not because of the years I spent in the U.S. It's because my mother is American. And so oh, wow. I learned English with this accent. Right. And, oh. um, and, but they sent me to French school. So I was in, I, I, I studied in, Fran in, in French up uh -huh. until I left, um, you know, the, at the age of 14 and went to, um, went to the U.S. So I went to Dominique Savio as, uh, for primary school and went to Collège Liberman for secondary school. So that's oh. where I spoke French. And I, 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 I'd never written a, a letter in English until I, I arrived in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, but the accent is because of my mom. It's not because oh, wow. I spent too many years here. So That's quite interesting. There's some, things, there's some things that are actually easier for me in French. Like um, yes. I end up like counting in French and th those things that you learn very early, I do in French. Yeah. But, yeah. but my, my intellect um, is, is English. <laughs> it's hard for me sometimes to express exactly what I want to say when when I'm speaking in French and it's, it's harder for me, for sure. Wow. So uh, coming back to Cameroon now, the currency crisis, the crisis de vues that befell the country recently, and we saw the um, communique that was sent out by is it Jimap or Jimat. Uh, and in one of your tweets, you advise that if the government could solve this problem by encouraging and installing more mobile money services. But we know that with most governments, not necessarily Cameroons, they're moving out to tax mobile money. And you already mentioned earlier about, you know, killing the golden goose. So what other solutions can be visited to resolve this currency crisis in Cameroon? Because businesses are suffering. Yeah, they are. And I, and I suggested also that, you know, they allow visa on arrival. Oh, yes. And so many countries get so much of their foreign currency by accepting dollars and euros to pay visas when people arrive, right? So it doesn't mean that you're not, you don't have a visa. And it doesn't mean that you have to allow the person into the country. It just means that when they arrive, they can get their visa right there and you generate foreign currency. There's so many people that, you know, don't visit countries that don't have, um, that have visa requirements yet. Because, you know, they're like, hey, you know, I have a few days. Oh, you know, get on a plane, go to go to Nairobi. They can do that. And they get there and they pay for a visa. And it's funny because Kenya, Tanzania, some of these countries, they don't take their own currency mm -hmm. for, to pay for a visa, which I yeah. always found weird. But it's a yeah. way for them to to get this currency. And so mm -hmm. I think that's one um, that's one way um, of, of of helping this crisis and also getting more people to visit like Cameroon. I mean, it's so difficult to come into the country. Um, yeah. that, you know, sometimes people, you go and go, you get, you, we know it, right? Some of our, yeah. our, 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 our Anglophone brothers, because yeah. they have an Anglophone name, they even get the visa and then they land and then they tell them you can't come in. So uh -huh. what difference does it make if you just fly in and then get your visa on arrival? So I really encourage the Cameroon government to get away from that visa ahead of time, do visa on arrival, um, at least for all Africans, um, it will, it, you know, I think that's a great step. A lot of African countries are moving towards that. And mm -hmm. the other thing about the, 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 the crise de devise is that if we look at it, mm -hmm. who is sending the most money outside? Mm -hmm. So when we buy weapons mm -hmm. to fight a war, mm -hmm. are we paying in CFA? Or are we paying in dollars? Dollars, of course. Right? Yeah. So when we, um, you know, get these huge government contracts, how much of the money is actually private sector? You would see that most of the money that leaves in, you know, in, in most of the currency that we have at BIAC is actually used by the government. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know what the numbers are, but, you know, look at the, the volume. And we import, uh, by the way, we import our fuel. Wow. Right? Uh, and we pay for that. Oh, yes. And we pay for them in, in U.S. dollars. Right? So, so you know, there, there are a whole, whole bunch of, of issues um, mm -hmm. that are interrelated. And, and we cannot say 
that you can solve this currency issue without resolving the Anglophone issue. It's not possible. Because mm -hmm. look at all of the foreign currency that came in when we sold all the agricultural products that came in from Northwest and Southwest. Mm -hmm. that, that brought in additional um, foreign reserves, right? Mm -hmm. So our foreign reserves were increased mm -hmm. by exports. Mm -hmm. Those exports have now reduced significantly. Mm -hmm. And because of the issue, our imports have increased because we're now purchasing more weapons. Mm -hmm. to fight this war. So mm -hmm. you have this, and until that crisis is resolved, we will mm -hmm. have a foreign currency crisis. Mm -hmm. You can't not fix one aspect and then expect the other to be resolved. Yes. Oh, wow. That's very interesting because one wouldn't have thought of that. But just continuing on that banking thing, I just thought there's one fact to put out there. Maybe you as a business person, you've encountered it because I was reading a report from uh, Doing Business in Cameroon and he was saying something like, um, in Central Africa in general, those aged uh, over 15 and above, just 10% of the population is actually banking, which means that there's a huge lag in financial knowledge uh, with, amongst adults. So adding on this kind of issue, so it makes it difficult for people to see where the problems could arise and how they yeah, can... Because I, but see, I, I think that we can leapfrog that. I don't think that having a bank account mm -hmm. equals being um, banked, right? People use mobile money uh, mm -hmm. more so than anywhere else. In uh, uh, the percentage of Africans that are are, are using mobile money yeah. is exceeds that on any other continent, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we still have to start unthinking the traditional bank where you go in and deposit money and they never give it to you and they charge you a fortune every month for the mm -hmm. privilege of keeping your money in their bank. Um, we need to, we, we don't have to follow that model. We mm -hmm. can have our own model as an African model. Um, mm -hmm. And it could be linked to blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. It could be linked to so many other ways of, of thinking about money and how money changes hands that doesn't mm -hmm. need to go through a bank. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go back into our tradition and see mm -hmm. how we exchanged money, you mm -hmm. know, and how can we replicate that using technology? I think mm -hmm. that's what we need to look at, is that how can we use our own social ways? Look at these tontin and the, the jangi, you know, yeah. that's how, that there's such an important component of finance in our country, yet mm -hmm. they're not considered like when these people, because they're sitting in Washington, D.C. or Paris doing their studies and their reports, they don't mm -hmm. see because they don't understand how we function. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that that's why it's so important that the decisions be made on the continent, for the continent, by Africans themselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because we know the best solutions for our problems, which may not be problems that somebody can see um, or when they're sitting in another situation. Like, like I, I, I was in a judging um, recently and I was sitting in London and there was this startup and talking about foreign exchange, there's this one startup that that is able to, you know how like people do currency swaps, right? So you go in the WhatsApp group and you're like, hey, you know, I have Naira, I need dollars, you know? And so it's very scary because you're sending, you're having to send money through PayPal or something like that. And you don't know yeah. that the person will really give your person the money on the other end. Or... And so they formalized that and they've created a, an app to uh -huh. do this currency swap, oh, which wow. is brilliant. It's uh -huh. brilliant. But who else would know that? If you're not in Africa and you're uh -huh. not having that problem, exactly. how would you sit in in, in London or Berlin or and understand that this is a real problem and this is a real solution. So I think mm -hmm. that when we look at banking and I think that if we decide on what we want for our financial systems, they won't mm -hmm. look like uh, banking overseas. Mm -hmm. You know, what I, what I would like is for us to open our minds, you know, and not feel like 
anything that we do has to be a copy of what's done overseas. So, yeah. so you know, those we just really need to think outside of the box. And I and I to be honest, that's one of the reasons I don't believe in the Jumia model. Is because Jumia, do you know that the CEO of Jumia recently said that um Africa has no retail. He went on oh. television and said Africa has no retail because they don't see it. For them, retail is a supermarket, right? Yeah. That's why their logo is a, a supermarket cart. Tell me how many Africans have ever seen a supermarket cart? How many? How many? We don't shop like that, right? We don't shop that way. And so they've created this logo of something that Africans can't recognize, right? Mm -hmm. Except for the very elite um, mm -hmm. that they can't recognize and created a model that Africans can't find themselves in. We don't go to supermarkets aisle down the aisle and then put things in a basket and then go mm -hmm. to the cash register, give our credit card and pay and leave. That's not no. how we buy. No. And so I think that's why their model is so twisted. And I don't, I, I, and I think that because they didn't, they did it from Europe and not from mm -hmm. Africa, they have no understanding of, 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 of what we need. Um, yeah. And I think that that's why I'm so glad that I now live in Cameroon. I, I just happen to be in the U.S. right now, but because mm -hmm. it's really important to be there and live there and understand the problems that we have with electricity. You know, there there's so many problems that people on the other side of the world they can't imagine, mm -hmm. they can't mm -hmm. understand. You know, yeah. so um and and so I think that having this ability to um, to build our own solutions that yeah. may not look anything like anything that's designed anywhere else in the world. It's really important. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that our financial systems won't look anything like what they look like in Europe. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I don't think that, you know, I think that we just need to be allowed to build our own. Certainly. So um, the governance situation in Cameroon, um, Moving on from that crisis, the devise or currency crisis is deteriorating with the anglophone crisis, the locking up of opposition leaders, Maurice Camto, um, you know, Michonne Ducky, the speaking out, uh, someone in the legal profession, journalists in prison. The government has been taking initiative by creating commissions, but not all the key people have been involved. So do you think that if women were engaged in those discussions, things would have taken a different turn? Um, I'm not sure. Because, you know, it's, it's not just taking part in discussion. It's having decision making power. I think that, you know, the, the government, whether there are women in government today, um, I'm not sure that they do any more for us than the men do or don't do. Um, I, 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 we do need dialogue, but I don't think it's a question of women and men. Um, obviously, there is a problem is that in our government and our parliament, um, in our in our Senate, the the, mm -hmm. the number of women leaders are is, is too low, um, but that's not. I don't think that that's why we have the current problem. You know, yeah. I think that we have the current problem because we have really bad leadership. Um, you know, we have a government, the a president that's been in power for too long, um, yeah. and you know, after a while, it's like you need to move forward and you need to lead. Let other people make their own mistakes. You know, perhaps. Because you're so experienced, la force de l'experience. <laughs> because you're so experienced, you feel like yeah. you can't let go. Because if you let go, then you know those kids they're gonna mess it up. We might just mess it up. Yeah. But we need to go through that. We you know we need to move forward and 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 you know because when you have such stagnation, like you have the same system and it doesn't change, and mm -hmm. um, you won't. You can't expect different results just because you have different people, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have a few yeah. extra women in there, all of a sudden, oh, the system is all better. No, not at no. all. I think that you know we 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 need um we need a a a a, a new a new government <laughs> completely. I think. Please don't <laughs> get me into too much trouble. No, 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 no. no. Um, I'm 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 it's because I always say, you know. C'est notre papa, right? Mm -hmm. So we want him to go rest. It's not, it's like anger. I'm not angry. I'm just like, papa, please go rest. Let us take over, make our own mistakes. Please. Yeah. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on the Swiss mediation process to address the deteriorating anglophone crisis in Cameroon? 
I, th I think I don't know enough about it to comment on it. Um, I don't know if it's genuine. Um, mm -hmm. I would hope that it's genuine because I, at least it's progress. You mm -hmm. know, I, I think if we had started with dialogue in 2016, we wouldn't yeah. be where we are now. But mm -hmm. there, the difference is, you know, I always say that when I talk to some of my Francophone friends, even those who, in the bottom of their heart, they feel for us, mm -hmm. but they don't really understand, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I can't really expect them to because they don't have the same experience. Like, they don't mm -hmm. have the same living experience. Um, mm -hmm. They haven't lived through the same thing. So, but I think that we had to start with dialogue. The problem yeah. is you had two people, two groups, right? You had government mm -hmm. and you had um, the, the the movement at the time that were yeah. speaking in two different, not just languages as in one English, one French, mm -hmm. right? But two different yeah. mindsets, mm -hmm. completely different mindsets. And, and so without realizing that they're thinking from two different mindsets. And I think that if I had had any advice to give to the government back then and the same that I would give to them today, uh -huh. understand A, that you don't understand, uh -huh. right? It's almost like, even if you're like in a, 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 a using the racial situation, right? Yeah. So if, you, if you're a white male and mm -hmm. you're a, a, a black woman is talking to you about I feel like you discriminated against me. Uh -huh. You can't know better than her what she feels. And uh -huh. so no matter how much you say that, no, I never discriminated, I treat you the same, that's not how I feel, uh -huh. right? And so I, because there was this breakdown in in the way they communicate um, yeah. I, I, from the very beginning, um, and the Anglophones also not understanding that the Francophones are coming from a completely different, even historical basis. We don't even know the same history. I'm blessed. I say blessed because I went to French school. I went to yeah. Francophone school. Mm -hmm. And I know what they learned about our history. Mm -hmm. And it's not the same that I learned at, at home. Mm -hmm. And it's not so, so you have, you know, Anglophones frustrated that. Francophones don't understand or can't relate, or, and they think that they're, the Francophones are acting in bad faith, but it's yeah. because they don't know. They've never mm -hmm. been taught. They've never been told anything different than what the government has been saying. So mm -hmm. it, it's a real difference in, 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 the, in the, the approach and, mm -hmm. and not realizing that we're, 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 we're one is talking Chinese. And the other person is speaking, you know, uh, 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 German. Yeah. It's not even between Anglophones and Francophones. It's a real, very different um, way of looking at the world from a very different historical perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And and that that created this 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 problem that we that because it's come a war today, and you know, I so I don't know. Um, what the dialogue, um, that dialogue uh, yes. is really, um, <laughs> I don't know what that is about. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping it's genuine, but I don't see how you can dialogue when those people that you have to dialogue with are all in Kundin, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that there, there, there's, you, who are you talking to? I, I don't know who you're talking to, but you're not talking to the people that, are representative of those that have the issues. So, mm -hmm. um, I'm not I'm not very optimistic about mm -hmm. about that process, as long as as many people as we know are are locked up um, mm -hmm. um, in prison and not able to participate in this dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I'll just um, read a few comments and um, not ask you more political questions. And for those of our audience watching, some of you are, have expressed an interest to ask questions. So I've put a link in the comment section that you can use and we can bring you on live to ask all your questions to our, our, our queen of tech. Um, so one question we have here, 
we had a question from uh, Emmanuel Fon, who was saying, what are some tips Mrs. Rebecca can give to young entrepreneurs and startups on how to go about funding, which doors to knock, etc." Thanks for interesting interview, it was worth my time. Um, so yeah, so what, what advice I would give to somebody that's looking for funding first, have your product ready. <laughs> have at mm -hmm. least a prototype of your product, right? Mm -hmm. So and um, understand that the investor is going to invest in your business growth and in mm -hmm. taking your product to where it is, to where mm -hmm. it needs to be in order to become a profitable business. They're mm -hmm. not investing in your comfort, mm -hmm. right? There's no <laughs> comfort in entrepreneurship. So yeah. if you think that you're going to go, go raise money because, oh my goodness, I've had this happen so many times. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, but I have a family. I need to care for my family. I'm like, that's not, I'm not investing in that. You're going to mm -hmm. have to continue to sacrifice. And mm -hmm. so the entrepreneur will continue to have to show that the, the funding is going towards, you know, launching the product to a larger market or in a new market. Um, mm -hmm. And and so, though that, but have something, you know, don't, don't come with an idea. So many people have ideas. Oh, mm -hmm. so many ideas. Oh, mm -hmm. And I'm the only one to have this idea. No, so many people have had your idea. Are you able to execute on, do you have a plan mm -hmm. on, and are you able to execute on that plan? Show yeah. me that you can mm -hmm. and I will invest. You know, that investors are trying to make money. By the way, it's not charity. No. It's investment. And so my, my, my hope as an investor is that if I put money in your company today, and I put $10,000 and we saw, right, those people that put, you know, $10,000 in Uber when it first started, how that became $15,000, right? How that, you have $15,000, $15 million, right? So yeah. I think investors are always are, are, are all looking for that type of opportunity um, mm -hmm. where they're seeing some, some a product that has potential and um, mm -hmm. that needs financial support. And mm -hmm. need to take it to the next level. But I do, I encourage you, there's so many hubs mm -hmm. across Africa. I really encourage you, go register in your hub, get the support. They will, I, I, in, and I do mentor the entrepreneurs that are in our hub, right? That mm -hmm. are at active spaces. I, I don't have enough time to mentor everybody, but at least I commit to those that are, that are in our, in our, in our hub. Um, and I spend time with them and I look at what they're doing and I try to support them as, as much as I can mm -hmm. and get them ready for this investment. Mm -hmm. So we have another comment here from Henry Nobane, um, who's saying lots of funds change hands in formal, in formal groups um, like Jangi and other associations. We can create local financial houses operating with similar rules, with rules similar to those of Jangi houses. And Absolutely. we have Robert Fonja here, who's saying big supermarkets are the European way of shopping in Africa. We do well with the corner store. Uh, and we have Terence N and Tini Fair, who's saying Africans are the solution for Africa. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> we have, um, I think, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Arnaud Ahu Ahu, Ideas for Cameroonians by Cameroonians. Um, Someone here is not very happy that you said to Mark Lee and Kume saying, I'm angry that man no be notre papa. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I do. I have to get back to Cameroon now. I might get there. They won't let me inside. <laughs> so we have um, Bacham Santa and many who saying anti Bex with the sense. If I catch anyone saying rubbish again, I stand. Um, um, <laughs> so um, we have Kinder Bueno here saying, please let's protect our, our Be our Rebecca by not asking her some political questions. Um, we've got Asheri Meredith who's saying, Pabia, go and rest so we can take over and make our own mistakes. And uh, Deli Singer Philip saying, oh yes, they don't really understand. Um, another comment still from uh, Robert Fondra who's saying, I think the problem we have is overflowing ego. I think it's to the question dealing with the women, if the situation would have changed if women were at the forefront of solution mediating. Uh, women have less ego than men. With women in decision-making positions, they might have decision-making closer to those concerned. This is what I think we need. Um, so, I can hear that from a man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh -huh. so we have a question here from Jean-Marc Jean uh, Nichu. My question to Rebecca will be to know what is advice in the project allowing to pay their health bills by mobile money? Um, well, I mean, there are some of those projects already um, that exist. So 
they, they, there are a number of, um, of systems like that where you can pay. You can pretty much pay anybody by mobile money that has a mobile money account. So it, you don't have to create a special one only for healthcare. Um, but there are some applications that where you can monitor your healthcare, um, you know, that can manage a clinic or a hospital um, that include uh, payments um, management by mobile money. But certainly, um, we just need to encourage more people to create mobile money accounts on the various platforms and to use them to conduct business. You know, from from even in the last three years, two, three years, I mean, I've seen the growth across the continent. It used to be that only Kenya with M-Pesa, um, East Africa in general was, you know, using mobile money. But 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 now we see it more and more and more. The, the growth in mobile money, if, if, if anybody looked at even MTN's um, uh, reports, uh, mid-year uh, financials, they'll see that the importance of mobile money and their growth um, because the rest of the business is not going as well, but but mobile money is growing by leaps and bounds. So I think mm -hmm. that we, we need to understand that mobile money is now here. It's not going mm -hmm. anywhere. And we start mm -hmm. to rethink whether or not, you know, at the people like at MasterCard and Visa won't like that. But we're not we're not going to go through that credit card thing. You know, uh -huh. so this is our ability to leapfrog is that we, we don't need that card. Right. Yeah. That, that our financial system is going to be different than that. Hmm. So I have a question here from Bole Kane, who's saying that, what do you think about funds uh, for mm -hmm. your business? Seems like everyone is utilizing that now. It's becoming a crowd idea. And just sorry, before you answer that question, uh, in countries like Nigeria, they don't allow crowdfunding because of some antiquated law or something. So carry on. As a matter of fact, they don't allow crowdfunding in most countries, including in Cameroon, where oh, we wow. are crowdfunding. But the difference is, that you can crowdfund for your business. So you can create a platform and mm -hmm. raise money for yourself, mm -hmm. right? What, when, when we say that crowdfunding isn't allowed, it's, it's generally that you, you have a business that's a crowdfunding platform where people mm -hmm. will come and put their projects and then anybody else can come. And, and so the, your, the crowdfunding platform is, creates the relationship, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not... But a startup raising um, their own money is allowed to raise money using crowdfunding. But mm -hmm. this is one area that we've talked about when we talk about policies, right? Mm -hmm. So we have, there's a South African woman who right now is working to try to get regulations for crowdfunding in place that are favorable to entrepreneurs um, from across the continent. She's even engaged with our, our uh, Central African banks uh, oh, wow. bank, uh, central bank um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to try to get, you know, so so there are efforts being made right now mm -hmm. to make sure that um, crowdfunding is included and it's a very large or important part of, of what um, those regulations will look like. Um, mm -hmm. Now, is it a good idea to crowdfund? Not everybody can launch a successful crowdfunding campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen Kiro being incredibly successful because they almost mm -hmm. have um, promoted this as it as a product. Mm -hmm. Right. So they have a whole marketing campaign yes. behind the crowdfunding. So yeah. if you go and you go onto a platform and you just go and say, oh, I'm raising money for this project. Don't expect to have the same success rate. Right. Okay. This was a crowdfunding campaign. It wasn't just raising money via crowdfunding. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes Kiro very unique. And they created a platform within which they could share information about the business, about um, you know, how it's going. Um, not only will not everybody be, be successful at raising money this way, so it's not easy. It takes a lot of hard work, a lot of thought. Um, mm -hmm. But even those who are able to raise the the risk that you run uh -huh. is that you're taking people's money that aren't experienced investors uh -huh. and their expectations might not be met, right? Uh -huh. No matter how much text you have on the screen that says, we're not, you know, you won't see your money again for a while, that it's a long-term investment, 2030, whatever. It doesn't matter what you write. 
mm-hmm. somebody that's taken their hard earned money, but not a professional investor or mm-hmm. isn't an experienced investor is doing mm-hmm. it really more to support as a, as a means to support the community. Mm-hmm. When they see you, you know, and your company is making tons of money in two years or it has raised millions of dollars. And then they're seeing that they're not getting a return on their investment because mm-hmm. you said, no, 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 we're keeping that money until 2030. I, I fear that there could be some, um, some backlash. So yeah. we have to be very careful. It's not an easy way to raise money. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not a sure way, you know, even in the long term to raise money, but it is an option and it's an option that we should use. Um, it's a tool. Angel investment is another tool. Um, venture capital is another tool. One tool that we should just not worry about too much is banks, right? It, this is not, <laughs> don't spend a lot of energy on, on banks. Yeah, so uh, I have a comment here from uh, Lumne Angela. Personally, I see a lot of amazing startups in the early stage, especially in Karen, but majority really never grow or scale up. What do you think are some of the issues apart from political problems? Um, I think sp- some of it is is being in the right environment. And again, I, I always encourage you, like, the, the, the use of a hub helps you for several reasons. First of all, is that, you know, they give you the tools, right? They help you t- tell you how to, you know, to create your business model. And then it's more accountability because when you're in, especially when you're in a formal in- incubation program, you set mm-hmm. targets, right? As a, as a startup, you set you, you you set targets that, and you have to be you're accountable to another entrepreneur. You're accountable to somebody else because at the end of the month, we'll come look at okay, these are the targets that we set. These are the objectives that we set in your business. Where are you on based on those targets? You know, what have you been able to accomplish? What haven't you accomplished? Not mm-hmm. all entrepreneurs feel comfortable. Yeah. Um, being accountable to somebody that's not an investor, that's not, uh, you know, that's not a partner, that's, you know, yeah. they don't, they don't, they don't necessarily. So you need to leave your ego at home mm-hmm. if you want to be successful as a startup entrepreneur. You mm-hmm. need to leave your ego at home. Mm-hmm. You need to listen to advice. Yeah. But also go forward. Don't give up. Right. Because it's so easy to give up when. We have so many challenges that it's yeah. so easy to give up. It's so easy. And it's like our families, our friends, they don't understand entrepreneurship. It's like, why are you wasting your time on that thing? Go get a job. You know, they don't get it. And so, yeah. you know, it, it can be very lonely to be an entrepreneur, which again, you know, get involved in a community, support each other um, and move forward together. And I think that's how you can be successful. So we have another question here from Banga Pen. Um, so um, one of the things needed to grow the business is awareness. How can the platform of Active Space assist entrepreneurs in this direction? Um, so one thing that we do is that your startup is listed, obviously, on our website. Um, we do talk about the startups that are involved in um, in our community. Um, mm-hmm. We also share a lot of opportunities with them because if there are opportunities for grants, which I don't love, but it's a great way to start you know, when you don't have enough money, you get into in, into a competition and you get five thousand or twenty five thousand. Um, it really can help. And um, so we get a lot of those um, within Active Spaces. We receive a lot of those requests. Say, hey, by the way, there's this competition or that competition, or this is there's this opportunity for entrepreneurs, and we're able to share that with our our, our community of entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. So um, I have another quick uh, comment here from uh, Robert, who's saying that many security issues have been raised with the mobile money systems, mostly not tech related, though. Call both people have devised means to swindle money from poor men and women in our villages. Um, and we yeah, have I think another- we always have dishonest people, regardless of the system. Um, you know, we need to raise more awareness so that our 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 cousins and aunts and uncles that are in the village can um, better use those tools um, so that they don't have to go through a call box um, in order to to receive their 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 funds. So, yeah. uh, you know, it goes through education. It will take time. Um, and I think that our systems, the Bulma money systems, will become um, better and will address some of these issues um, as we go forward. 
Okay, so I have a, a last question from Jean-Marc before we carry on. Uh, Jean-Marc Nichu, thanks a, a lot, uh, Rebecca. Another question, please. What happens if an entrepreneur raises money and uses it on his project, but this one ends up not being successful? Must he pay the money back? <laughs> no, and, and as a matter of fact, most of the startups will end up that way. And that's not unique to our environment. That's all over the world. Most mm -hmm. startups and most investments don't, like we lose our money as investors, we just lose our money, which is yeah. why it's such a risk for us. You can't pay the money back because it's not a loan mm -hmm. and you did what you were supposed to and you still failed. It will happen. You know, mm -hmm. you have um, it happens. And, and, you know, from from an angel investment standpoint, one of the things that ABAN has done is uh, organized some boot camps and some master classes. We had one in Cameroon um, a couple of years ago um, yeah. where we had very experienced investors come to um, share their back, their experience in angel investing. And one of the things we hear over and over and over again is that you have to build as an investor a portfolio of companies. You can't just invest in one company, right? Mm -hmm. Because the likelihood of that company failing is quite large. And the, 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 what they're saying is that, you know, you'll build a portfolio of maybe 15 companies uh -huh. with which you put in mon money. Out of yeah. those 15, five will fail dramatically. You'll lose all your money, right? Yeah. Then yeah. two won't lose money, but won't make money, uh -huh. right? Um, one may make you a little bit of money, and then, or two may make you a little bit of money, and then one will be incredibly successful. Uh -huh. And so that's the one that pays for all the rest, right? Uh -huh. That's the one where you put in 5,000 and it turns into 250,000, which is a very specific example that I have in Africa. It's not some taken from Silicon Valley. This is, you know, a, 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 an investor friend of mine that put in 5,000 um, uh -huh. and um, got a, a then got 250,000 um, as a return on his investment. And then mm -hmm. that allows him to spread the risk. So you need to spread the risk um, mm -hmm. as an investor. But yeah, I mean, we lose money, we lose money. If the, the, the startup fails, they fail. And mm -hmm. me, I don't mind as long as the entrepreneur used the money in order to build the business and not to go, you know, like, you know. Yeah, yeah, just like get, get a new car and, you know, yeah. Not yeah. This is not comfort money. I always say that it's not comfort money. Yeah. So I have a question here from Tommy Davies. What should entrepreneurs do to check out investors? Um, that's a very good point. Um, and yeah, that's a very good point. What what can they do to? Um, I need to get a battery. Oh, I dear. need to get a no 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 charge my phone. It's fine. I have lots of charging phones here. But um, <laughs> oh, um, so. Yeah, so what can entrepreneurs do to check out investors? The best thing is, are they part of a network? It's so helpful when the investor is already part of a network because the network serves as kind of a filtering system, um, mm -hmm. filters out the, the, the people that are not serious um, as investors. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say the, the easiest thing you can do is to... Um, is to check out um, if they're part of a network. Also, what other investments have they made? What is their relationship with the uh, entrepreneurs in which they've already invested? Those are some of the things that you can you can look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm gonna just, I'm not leaving. I'm just gonna get a charger. Yeah. Just no, that's one. fine. And while you are gone, so we're going to go through I'm some of the comments. I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> it's all right. So we're going to be reading some of the comments here. Um, so I'm sorry, Dean, that I've not been able to ask you a question, but I think it has some political elements, which is why I've been avoiding it. So Dean was asking, uh, is the crisis in Cameroon today as a result of the unfinished decolonization process by the British in the 60s, or is it because the Francophones are not taught their history in school? If so, are the Anglophones complaining of the average man not knowing their history, or are they complaining about the systematic assimilation by their elites in government? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a complicated question for me. Um, but yes. what, one thing that I would say is that the, look at the Hong Kong crisis today. Right. So um, 
they all speak the same exact language, mm. but they developed different systems. We can, mm. we can complain morning, noon, and night that we're just colon colonized and we're dealing with two different colonial legacies, but it's the truth. We don't like it, but it's a truth, right? So we, 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 um, we might reject that as an argument, but the fact is that these are very different systems, just mm -hmm. like Hong Kong and mainland, I mean, China have different systems, mm -hmm. um, even though it's the same language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you can see and understand and try to understand the challenges that, um, that, that Hong Kong is and, and what they're trying to fight for today and why they're protesting today, I think mm -hmm. you can better understand why Anglophones were protesting. It's, it's, listen, this is the system that we've been using for longer than we've been together because even before the Germans, we had um, English speaking schools, Alfred Saker, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. So this is the system of schooling that we're used to. This is the system of justice that we're used to. Um, you're coming and you're wanting to change it all to be an image of a French based system. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you may not like the way we've been doing it, but that's our system. And I think mm -hmm. that's also what, um, you know, the, the, the people in China and Hong Kong are, 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 are fighting over today. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So anyways, we'll carry on. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, you fought hard um, or you've been advocating for the release of Maurice Camto and Michelle Doki, among others, especially for journalists. Are you not afraid that the wrath of La République <laughs> will descend on you as exemplifying the cases of the two just named? <laughs> Listen, you know what? I, 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 they, uh, yeah, of course. I, 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 I'm not, I worry about um, the wrath as you, as you, as you called it. Um, I worry about it, but I'm not afraid of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I love my freedom. And <laughs> that includes my freedom to think mm. and my freedom to express myself. Yeah. and my freedom to feel, and I love that freedom. So mm -hmm. for me, um, it's sometimes, sometimes I feel like there are some Cameroonians mm -hmm. that are more imprisoned mm -hmm. than those that are in Kunding. <laughs> That's a nice right? one. And, yeah. and, and it's not to minimize the difficulty and the, I mean, the tragedy of mm -hmm. all those people that are in prison in Kundingi. But sometimes I feel like we've locked ourselves in this mentality that is mm -hmm. a prison. So you mm -hmm. may feel like you can walk and you can, you freely, but you're not free. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not free. And mm -hmm. so we need to free our minds, you know, mm -hmm. and we start there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, because it's, it's not, there's nothing rational about all those people being in Kundingi today. Nothing rational about it. Mm. But somehow, some Cameroonians that are outside are able to rationalize it. I don't know how they do that. And I, I, I can't. Mm. So yes, I will com continue to advocate um, on behalf of those whom I feel might be um, in prison um, for, um, and it shouldn't be. Um, and that's my freedom. Because if I don't, who will? Like, I always say this, is like there's some things that I can say and do because yeah. I have a voice. You know, yeah. and I don't think our good Lord gave me this voice either on social media or, you know, in, in, in places of where there are people of authority just to use yeah. it to talk about me. You know, mm -hmm. I think part of it is to, to, to bring and to raise attention and awareness to issues that I can't solve. But maybe uh -huh. somebody that hears me can can solve. Yeah. So you fought hard to bring back our internet on Twitter and any platform that you are quoted an audience, you discuss this issue. So thank you very much for contributing to getting internet into the Anglophone regions of Cameroon. I am sure the tech community are overjoyed and granted um, huge losses were made as a result. And, you know, they, they continue with the current crisis as you already outlined in the 
relationship between crise de devise and you know uh, shortage in exports from the, uh, the anglophone region so shutting down the internet has become the weapon of choice amongst uh, governments to censor people can we not say that there was a civil lining with this move by the cameron's government as it allowed developers or those in the tech business to create solutions that do not rely on using the internet um yes well, yes, I mean, that's the silver lining. Certainly, you know, what we saw is a lot of innovation. Again, how do we how do we circumvent the system? Um, and and again, I always repeat this because the, the sense of community in um, the it with, you know, the Anglophones um, in in Boya that were mm -hmm. actually carrying phones back to uh, to Douala in order to to have other people access the internet, download the messages, and then take the phones back. You know, we saw a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. And we've also seen that um, some social networks, and I don't want to name them right now because I don't know who's <laughs> listening. I don't want them to go and start targeting them. But but yeah, we did see the the um, the, the creation of some local uh, so some local um, social networks and mm -hmm. uh, no, local messaging systems. Um, yeah. that, that it would be difficult to um, to to ban without cutting off the entire internet, which yeah. I think they've learned their lesson there. Yeah. So I'll just quickly read some comments um, relating to what we just said earlier. So we have this from uh, Kingsley Shete. Uh, the worst form of imprisonment is mental rather than physical, just like you said. Um, Mimi Mepho says, I call it mental jail. The victims are bound. The system is responsible. Um, so we have someone here saying, first time following Delhi TV Live, and I'm glad I did. Thank uh, you for joining me. <laughs> And so we have uh, Paul uh, Tentau who's saying that um, there are more Cameroonians who are in prison than those who are in Kondengi, therefore high level of mental imprisonment in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. um, really good one there, thank you. So um, we're going to move on to something slightly different here, Rebecca, and um, it's a fire round question. Um, oh, this round I know which one's coming. <laughs> very quick responses and you're not to think it all before responding so it should be a natural knee-jerk response are you ready yeah okie doke let's go google chrome or safari uh google chrome windows or ios windows mark zuckerberg or mark bernioff oh benioff all the way <laughs> michelle donkey <laughs> Oh, come on. You're asking Kawala. <laughs> La Piro de Baga or Loge Loge? Uh, La Piro. Patrice Ngana or Ashil Mbembe? Ashil Mbembe. Boya or Washington, D.C.? Boya. World Bank or Bayak? <laughs> Ooh, World Bank. Uh, Timbuktu or Fumban? Fumban. Scrambled eggs and toast or Quackaco Bible? Oh, come on. Who eats scrambled eggs? Let's move on. <laughs> ben Sikin dance or Makosa? Um, Makosa. Afro hair or wig? Oh, I know how this is my hair. So I said it's not <laughs> Afro. <laughs> no, wig, no wig, no wig. Not yet. So you survived that round. How do you feel? Would you have changed your answers if you had more time to think about them? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, great. So um, we're gradually coming towards a conclusion, Rebecca. Do you have any final words to the Cameroonians out there who look up to you as a mentor? Wow. Okay. Um. I. I. Wow. Okay. So, so one thing I. I. I don't want to be cubbyholed into um, some respectable woman isn't allowed to say this or do that and. And I, you know, this this past week on Twitter, I expressed myself on a subject that um, most people didn't expect me to express myself on. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm I want to be free that way. I don't want to be um, put in a box of what is proper for me to do and say, and what is not proper for me to do and say. It's mm -hmm. you know, after my my many years on Earth, I think I've earned the right to express myself on the topics that I want um, and in the manner in which I want. And I don't want, don't take that away from me. <laughs> so 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. So we have a quick question here before we close. So we have a question from Bamai Namata who's saying, Rebecca, the government thinks about the digital economy every day without any tangible results. Do you have any ideas on how to better engage with government? There is obviously massive support that is being misappropriated from this front. Yeah, I don't even know what that support is, to be honest. I think that there are some programs that they've launched that are, that, as I said, they're well-intentioned. It's just that they're not going to go anywhere. So I think that um, it, it, there's a mix between two things. Um, there's a mix between complete incompetence. Um, and um, I'm looking at the, um, there, there's a mix between total incompetence and a mix with um, maybe corruption and those types of things. And I, there's, so there's a mix and I'm all, I'm not a, a Everybody is bad. Everything is bad. There are some people that are in this government that are trying to do things. Um, I wish they would talk to us because we would make it so much easier for them. Um, but I, I have refused to take one franc from them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, not that they've offered, to be honest. <laughs> but, but I, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I even, I don't even want active spaces to receive money from from the government because, you know, it's for some reason, like you always end up. Like it always ends up being a scandal some way down the road. Um, mm -hmm. And then I don't want my name to be associated to that. And I don't want Active Spaces' name to be associated to that. Um, but I'm not categorical, oh, all are bad. They, there's a, just a level of incompetence there that's mixed in with the bad faith. Um, yeah. Uh, quickly, we have, uh, I think people know that we're closing, so they, everyone wants to send in their last questions before Hello. we go. Um, so I have a question from a gentleman here by the name of Habis in Sowi. Um, hi, madam. My question is on Twitter. Cameroon isn't on the list of locations when you're checking trends or searches. I think that's because we have not really much Cameroonian presence on Twitter. What do you think can be done about this as I find Twitter really good, interactive and educative? So we should know our trends. Well, I don't work for Twitter, but they should hire me, right? <laughs> and, but but they should, yeah. So so to tell them how to better penetrate the Cameroonian um, the Cameroonian market. But actually, I I do know some people in inside Twitter, um, and we've started that conversation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of our accounts that aren't certified. There are some accounts that, that we had some accounts get that that got suspended. Mm -hmm. um, and that should never have gotten suspended. You know, we we had we already have um, a dialogue with Facebook, so mm -hmm. that and we have an open line with Facebook, so that when they suspend an account um, from one of our activists or journalists, um, mm -hmm. because you know the government uh, trolls were able to tag them and tag them and tag them, um, mm -hmm. we're able to we we do know how to get that information to Facebook for them to restore that those accounts. What we don't have is um, that same relationship with Twitter at this moment, but we're building it. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, we're hoping that the same things that we've been able to do with Facebook, we'll be able to do with Twitter. Some of those things are, again, the, the trends, yes, um, the um, having um, the certifications for, for more of our accounts, especially for activists and politicians on both sides of the, on all sides. Um, and yeah, so that dialogue has started. Yeah. So what is your impression of Daily TV? <laughs> oh, so, it was so much fun. It was so much fun and no stress. So no, no too many hard questions. <laughs> so yeah, I really, I really appreciate the time that you gave me. I feel very honored to have this opportunity um, to speak to a larger community of people that aren't necessarily on Twitter because I run my mouth on Twitter day in day out, um, yeah. but I'm not on Facebook. I'm not very active on Facebook. So yeah. thank you for allowing me to share. There you have it, good people, as all good things must come to an end. Rebecca, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit with us. You have no idea how grateful we are and how much mm -hmm. we've been. I'm the one that's grateful. Thank you very <laughs> much. And so to everyone out there, um, Rebecca is not on Facebook very much, but she's very active on Twitter. You can follow her. She's at Africa, Afriteki. Um, so Africa she has Techie. African Techie. And on Instagram. Okay, and she's also on Instagram. So people, please do follow her. She has always a lot of information to share, very informative stuff. I follow her as well. I learn a lot uh, from her tweets. So to all our audience out there, thank you for always sticking with us and being fair in your diverse opinions. And until next time, enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Bye. <laughs>